Hello, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. Harlem is known as the black mecca of the world, the place where you'll find landmarks like the iconic Apollo Theater, the Schomburg Center, Sylvia's Restaurant. It's uh, culture, jazz, and style. And our guest, Daniel Dapper Dan Day, Harlem's fashion icon and designer. Dapper Dan has designed for hip hop and rap artists such as LL Cool J, Salt and Pepper, Beyonce, and has done collaborations with The Gap, Louis Vuitton. Gucci, to name just a few, and I am honored to have you with us today. It is such a privilege. Oh, Carol, I couldn't tell you enough. Huh? I'm, I'm sitting here look like I'm walking through the pages of time. Being here with you is so amazing. I've looked up to you for so many years. I admire you and the footsteps that you made available for me always wanting to be a journalist. I so, know, I so know. I'm that so was, happy to be here today. That was so much fun to learn. And you did, in fact, write for a paper, for 40 Acres and a Mule. Yeah, yeah, 40 Acres and a Mule. And I got to spend with uh, uh, Dick Reeves, the writer from the New York Times. I got to spend the day with him because I was one of the chosen writers. And um, it was so exciting. I mean, my initiation, well, my touch of being able to, like, reach out was uh, first through the... 40 Acres and a Mule, you know, a radical young newspaper for kid, all of us kids in Harlem, Latinos and African American. Right, right. Well, you know, uh, journalism's loss is fashion's gain, and you've written a wonderful memoir as well. So you're still a writer, still a fantastic observer, you know, of things. So we've gone through all of the list of your fabulous fashion cred, so to speak, but it was not always the case. And, and so you're a Harlem boy, which I love. I, I'm, I live in Harlem. I love it. You know, it's, a, it's a, a place I've always wanted to live and hope will be there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, forever for the culture, for the history and all. And you uh, speak to that uh, as well, of wanting to keep yourself placed in this cultural uh, milieu. Yes. Um, I think people often ask me, how am I inspired? And I tell them that I grew up in Harlem when it was a village. It's a community now. And the difference between a, vill a village and a community is that in a village, everybody's connected. Mm. The village is more hello than any place, any community that you could ever see. Right. You know? And so I grew up in that seeing like the mothers all up in the windows and looking out over the street, looking out, taking care. And probably what has changed since I've grown up in Harlem is that I grew up with, to give you an example, my friends was Alonzo and Nagodio, Greeks, poor like me. Mm -hmm. Not as poor as me, but poor like me. Alonzo and Nagodio, Greeks. Bobby Bamondi and Richard Bamondi live next door, uh, Italians. Jackie Michaels, my friend from the first grade, Irish. So I grew up in, a, in, in an America that I don't think anybody's going to ever see again. I grew up with poor Irish, poor Italians, poor Greeks, poor Jewish people, and, and poor uh, Puerto Ricans. We had the first uh, uh, large population of Italians that was in East mm -hmm. Harlem. Mm -hmm. We had the uh, San Gennaro Festival was there. We had the first Puerto Rican Day Parade was in Harlem. The uh, first uh, African Day Parade was in Harlem. The first West Indian Day Parade was in Harlem. So, and I grew up to see, and seeing all that. Um, and not to mention all the celebrities and stars, they were still in Harlem when I was growing up. One of the most fascinating things about, I went to PS24, which is on 128th Street. Is that, the, is that the same school that Jimmy Baldwin went to? Exactly, Jimmy Baldwin went there and, and and right across the street from the school, the godfather, what I call the godfather of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, Langston Hughes lived. People still visit that house, and I go by there to, to film all the time. So, you know, it was nothing for us to see people like, uh, celebrities like that and, and have them come in. I remember, um, like yesterday, I think one of the uh, most inspiring things that I uh, encountered in elementary school was when um, Hewlin Jack, who yeah. was borough president, first black yes, borough sure, president, sure. he came to PS24 and he spoke on our motto in the assembly. And the motto was, uh, knowledge is power. And so I followed his whole career. You've, right, so, right. 
and yeah. and 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 it certainly brought you to power. One of the things that uh, that you uh, share with Jimmy Baldwin uh, and in your memoir, uh, Dapper Dan, made in Harlem, which you know is mm -hmm. uh, true, true. You said anyone who has ever struggled with poverty knows how extremely expensive it is to be poor. Yes, absolutely. Um, I grew up swimming in the Harlem River in my underwear. Me and my friend William Gonzalez and some other guys in the neighborhood. And when I tell that to people today, they say, what, you swim in the Harlem River? Well, the Italian, I mean, when the Irish boys were swimming in the Hudson River, it was typical for poor people at the time. The river was something that wasn't far removed from our reality. You know, so I, I grew up swimming in the Harlem River with my underwear. And I lived in the last building before you reached the Harlem River at the very end of the avenue, you know. So I was a stone's throw from the river. Right, and, and, and a bunch of kids. You know. A bunch of kids. Yeah, it was, uh, I had three brothers older than me and three sisters younger than me, which was so convenient. I was placed right in the middle. So I was peeping in on my, what my sisters were saying and listening to what my older brothers were saying. So it was amazing growing up. So, and, uh, and, But as, even as a, as, a, as a kid, you know, we, we are now looking at you as this, uh, you know, fashion icon. but. You know, the, the, the beginnings of your life in fashion also had some detours. Uh, talk to us about, you know, that. You're a pretty good gangster, too, right? Oh, yes. I, I'm so happy that I grew up doing all the different musical genres because my mother went to the ballrooms in Harlem, you know? Right. And um, so I grew up listening to... Uh, I grew up with, like, every son Well, every morning we woke up, we listened to Joe Bostic, Gospel Caravan. I thought everybody in every... African-American household in America listened to Joe Bostic growing up. But yeah, I and mean, my brothers listened to jazz, and so I grew up during the uh, Calypso, you know, Harry Belafonte period. Right. So we was doing the Calypso. Later on, we was doing the Afro. And did uh, you have a name, Dancing Dan, then? Is yes, that... I had a name, Dancing Dan. That, that was part of the <laughs> That was before you popular. became Dapper Dan. <laughs> before I became Dapper Dan. I was Dancing Dan, yes. Yeah, I had uh, various titles uh, based on um, the popularity, whatever made you popular in Harlem at that time, I engaged in. Right, know. right. So now talk, talk to us about the trip to Africa that was, you know, very influential in your, you know, development, uh, and then how you got to fashion as the thing. Okay, so there's two primary trips, and I like to talk about the first one. The first one was inspired by, I had, uh, of course, I told you I wanted to be a journalist, and um, so 40 Acres in the Mule, we had like people from Random House coming in. We had uh, professors from Columbia University coming in and, and guiding us and tutoring us. And um, we had African American scholars coming in talking to us because we was a radical young newspaper. And so Columbia University offered me an internship for the summer of 68 with the option of, of receiving a scholarship to go to Columbia. But um, the Urban League had a program where they was going to send 24 young African Americans and Latinos to Africa to explore our, our history. And so a professor came, you know, a highly regarded professor, a uh, historian, Dr. Henry Clark came. Yes, of course, I know him. Yeah, I know, well. I know you, 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 you right. right up there with him, too. <laughs> so he came. And a student asked him, one of the guys like myself from the editorial board, asked him, um, if we're the original people, if African Americans are the original people on the planet, how come uh, we're doing the way we are today? And Dr. Henry Clark answered, he said that that's because of a transgression that we made against ourselves before Europeans came into our life. And that, like, that took away the stigma that I always had with being an African American. In other words, um, it relieved the identity crisis I was suffering from then. In the 60s, we had an identity crisis. It was like we blame 400 years of slavery for everything. Mm. It's, we, what took place was a tragedy. It was the worst part of, uh, that I consider of American history. But what Dr. Henry Clark did was he said, sometime you have to, from what I took from what he said, you have to understand the cause and, and don't dwell on the results. So I said, oh, so slavery was a result. It wasn't the cause. So I said, you know what, I'm taking this trip to Africa because he never elaborated. 
So I went to Africa to try to find out, like, what happened there that led to what happened here. Right. You know, so that changed my whole uh, way of looking at African American history, and and my identity crisis. Right. And and how did you get to to fashion? When when? So that was the fashion came about by holes in my shoes, and then but the whole idea hole, of fashion came. You had holes in your your shoes. And so yeah, holes in my shoes. Designing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Langston Hughes said, "If you want to know my blues, walk a mile in my shoes." But I don't think you can last a mile in them shoes that I had. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. so you right. were you were fixing you were fixing up your shoes. No, what happened was like um, when I was young, we all got all the boys got hand me downs, hand me downs. Right. So sure. By the time he got back, I mean, shoes was like pretty worn down. Right. And so um, I used to put paper in them. Paper wouldn't last you know, for the holes, to cover the holes. So we got real innovative. I started putting linoleum in. Ah. Right? And then when I put linoleum in, like, that wore out. The borders of the shoe could not support the linoleum. And, and that, that image stuck with me. But, Carol, the most important thing during them times um, of dressing was, like, being in Harlem and you go to 125th Street, mm -hmm. everybody was dressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody was dressed. You know, you never seen so many elegant-looking people of color. They all dressed to go to 125th Street. So if I had on my brother's clothes, you know, and I went to 125th Street, the whole image of who I was changed. The transformation that it allowed me to have changed. I say, I love the way that changed me. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So that is what impacted me early on. So fast forward. So when I go to Africa, the second time, first time I went, I didn't have any money. I did live-ins with family. Stayed at Kurosini International School where they were training uh, young Africans right. to fight in South America and all that, to South Africa. So anyway, but when I said, I'm going back on my own, I'm going to sponsor my trip. So I went back and, um, to see Muhammad Ali fight uh -huh. in Kinshasa Zaire. Right. And uh, when I found out that the plane stops everywhere and you can get off and it was three stops, I said, man, I'm getting off of every country this plane stopped at so I can explore the countries I haven't been in. Anyway, on the last lap of the trip, I was, the plane stopped in um, Monrovia, Liberia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I say, wow, this is real hysterical. So there was a, a, a Guinean tailor in uh, Monrovia, and I said, okay, I'm getting ready to go back. Let me go get some artifacts. So I go to the market to get some artifacts, and I'm dapper dance just like now. I'm so happy that I made money I could dress up. Right. So I go to the marketplace and I'm picking out artifacts and I say, man, I like this, I like this a lot. And the guy says to me, I like what you're wearing. I say, you want to trade? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll count. I was like, Dap now I'm Dapper Dan. I had, right, right, you know, I was right. dancing Danny and right, I was right, all those right, other Dannys. Right, right. right. Now I'm Dapper Dan. I went up into the hotel and got all my clothes. I got everything, all my luggage and everything, and traded for artifacts and traded it for him to do an uh, outfit for me. And this is where the whole idea, concept of Dapper Dan was born. I told him I want African fabrics, but I want African Harlem style. And so I made that, and that's how I came back to America. Uh, you know, so I went then, to Dapper Dan, and I came back, yeah. you know, uh, uh, I call came, it Blackenizing fashion. <laughs> yeah, uh, Africanizing that, fashion. That was, a, that was a powerful trip, you know. The, tra the trade oh, yes. turned out well. But then you, know, you st open your own uh, boutique. 24-7, yes. Yes. where you're creating now clothes for... Yes. Actually, um, I knew that I wanted to change my life. I was part of the, the dark side of the culture in Harlem, and all those things that take place on the street. And I didn't know, like, middle-class people and upper-class people, and they wouldn't... Um, they, would, they weren't inclined to shop with me, you know? So I said, I'm okay to the people who know me. Mm -hmm. and the ones who had money. So the only uh, liquid cash that was flowing through Harlem at that time was the number bankers and the drug dealers. I say, well, since they can afford luxury and I'm going to make luxury, right. you know, so I catered to them. And in order to cater to them, I had to be available to them and to their hours. So I said, you know what? I'm going to be open 24 hours a day so they can walk in here whenever they feel like And I had two shifts. And that's how I started out. Incredible, incredible. So now you you are creating, and one of the things that you're doing in creating at a certain point is using the labels from fashion houses. 
Yeah. So talk to us how that how that went and how that stopped, and then as we know now, how that started again when they decided that rather than opposing you, they needed to work with you mm -hmm. because you are the creative genius. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Now, in my effort to understand African American culture, uh, religion played a big role. So in the Nation of Islam my early experiences in the Holy Ghost Church, you know, all of that made me want to go back to a point where, where I can get as spiritual as possible. So I started studying religion and everything, and the, the more I studied religion, and the further back I went, I saw it, it evolved from first symbols, mm -hmm. you know, and then myths, and then organized religion. I said, wow, everything goes back to symbols. So, all right, now I'm into fashion. So a guy comes into the store. He's the biggest and most popular hustler in the street. His name is Jack Jackson, and, and he works with John Gotti, brother Gene Gotti. He got arrested. It's all over the newspaper and stuff. Well, he used to come to the store, mm -hmm. right? He buy, he's buying clothes from you. And buy his clothes from me and right. park his big Mercedes-Benz sports outside, souped right. up, and people in Harlem would come by and just stand in front of my store to see this guy. But anyway, he had a Louis Vuitton pouch one day when he came in, full of hundred dollar bills. You know, and well, what so, else would you carry? Yeah, yeah, no, no, you know, but, <laughs> in your Louis Vuitton pouch. Yeah. Right. So um, everybody was fascinated with the pouch because he had it, and um, because people weren't really that familiar with European brands, they were more uh, influenced by oh. Uh, Luxury stores where they got sure. Layton's Fire Mountains, Phil Cronfield, even AJ Lessers in Harlem. But the stores moved the fashion market in Harlem. But here, Jack comes in with this designer bag, and everybody gets excited. So Carol, I said, wow, look at they excited. Now, prior to that, yeah. I had been making uh, fur coats, exotic leathers, alligators, crocodiles. I dealt with all of uh, uh, Dupioni silks. I dealt with everything of that nature. Now here he comes with that bag and everybody gets excited about bag. I said, mm, imagine if I can get everybody, all my customers, walking around in Harlem looking like luggage. If Louis Vuitton can give them that little bit of symbols, because I see the power of symbols, I already learned the power of symbols from right. studying religion. So I said, it's the symbols. It's the symbol. So Carol, I went back to the drawing board and said, I got to teach myself how to take them symbols and put it on leather and mix it with furs and, and do all these things. And it just mushroomed from then. All the, first the gangsters, then the rappers, all the. Everybody. 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 And including, we have a clip of uh, Conan O'Brien who. Oh, Conan, who, oh, yeah, that who, was amazing. Who needed your ad dressing advice. Let's, let's take a look at this clip. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it. You think you, know, you don't like it? You, it's, it's, do, you know, do you think I look attractive in this? No. Wait, who asked you? <laughs> why did you jump in? I agree that you probably have the better idea, so why don't you swag me up? You do it. How do you get swagged up by Dad? That yeah. style. Yeah. Let's go do it. <laughs> Come on, yeah! He outdapped you. <laughs> he outdapped the dap that day. Oh my God, that is so great. Now, hey, this, Cal, you know that is, was that was like so amazing. I mean, do you know uh, how many times this has been watched? Like eight million times. This wow. Event, you know, wow. I mean, so you're like the 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 man. You know. Wow. So even though you were outdapped by Conan. Conan yeah, yeah, the, he outdapped me that. The day. walking stick is a part of the. Yeah, he, <laughs> he was amazing. You know, him coming to Harlem was like, that's the biggest thing since, uh, like, uh, theatrically. Since Colin, uh, Cotton come to Harlem, remember Cotton come to Harlem, the movie Cotton come to Harlem? I said, look ahead, this is amazing, man. And he's such a great personality. The people, you see how the people love them. Huh? I know, I know. Yeah. You, you did a good job of dressing him up. And, you, and I've asked for a, a version of the suit that you're wearing for me, you know, so. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, I got to have it. All right, all right, great, great. Y'all can so look forward to that, right? <laughs>
<laughs> Carol goes dapper. That's right. Carol is definitely going dapper. Now, so that you had this flourishing business of using the symbols, as you call them, from the big uh, European fashion houses, Gucci, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, the company started getting very upset and, sh and, and resulted in shutting you down. Uh, yeah. So that's the, the period uh, during which you, you know, what did you do? Do you call that the underground? or? Yeah, the... that was my underground period. You right. know? Um, I equate that probably with when I was in Africa. I noticed, I said, wow, uh, Joe Kenyatta spent so many years in jail, then they came back and made him president. Nelson Mandela spent so many years, and they came back right. and made him president. And the these big brands ran me underground, and then when after I came back, three years after I'm back, they gave me the highest award that you can get in fa in fashion, and that's the Geoffrey Beam Award. Congratulations! I, said, you know, I know that was that's for a lifetime achievement in yes. fashion. But that happened because Gucci. Uh, there was an incident where Gucci miraculously created something that looked very much like something that you had done. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly. And um, what what took place was this is Diane uh, Diane Dixon. She's an Olympian and won a gold medal in the Olympics. Right. And she was one of my main customers. She said, "Dad, I want something really exotic." So what you see, she has there is a mahogany mink. I mix that with mahogany mink and plonge leather that I uh, printed the uh, Louis Vuitton symbols on and trimmed with the uh, with leather uh, highlights. Right, right. Yeah. And, so that was a design that you did. That's you know? a design I did. And, then and this Gucci, is what Gucci did. And then Gucci did this other version where that yes. looks, yeah, no, 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 it's it's you. But what resulted from that was what a, was resulted from that the next a collaboration. Part of the story, yes. The next part of the story. Yes. The biggest next part of the story is African American women, because when they saw that they said, uh, uh we're not having that, you know. Have, and when I first started out, was no such thing as social media. But now we have black Twitter. And so the women got on black Twitter and said, uh-uh, we, we're not having that. We're not doing that. And so, and Gucci listened. Right, and made you a partner. And in, made me a partner. In, in designs. And now I see you going to the Met Gala with all of your fancy friends. You know, yeah. you're, you but, know, you're hanging out with the swells. Talk to us about some of the collaborations. Who are you designing for? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I was the first. African American to have my own table at the Met Gala. Ah, ah. You know, so everybody at that's my That's big. Table, that's big, yeah, Dan. Everybody yeah. at my table that I designed for, you know, and um, it was like phenomenal. That was uh, unheard of, and um, one and this, of the big one of the highlights of that moment was yeah. when uh, Selma Hyatt came. Ah. Right. Selma Hyman came to the atelier, you know, no longer had a boutique, but had an atelier, because I told Gucci, if we're going to be partners, I have to be able to continue what I was doing, but do it in Harlem. So in Harlem, I had my, my own atelier, and there is where I created all the styles. So what Gucci did that was so phenomenal, not only did I get a percentage of the the uh, collection that we made together that went around the world, the global collection, but they also gave me the ability to create, like I have been creating, you know, a design it yourself, right at the boutique in Harlem, at the atelier in Harlem. So that was amazing. So everybody who sat at my table uh, had on a creation by myself. By you. That's, yeah, that that is, so amazing. That it, is fantastic. It, it, and, it was phenomenal. And, and when, when you design for, uh, I understand you've got a whole thing on Instagram now that, you know, oh, yeah, brand I got, got, building. And yeah, yeah. What, tell us briefly about that. We, we're going to have to have you come back because we're running out of time. Oh, yeah, I got But, I, we, but yeah. tell us about the. Yeah, tell you all about how that's done because uh, the industry is moving so fast and people of color uh, have uh, such a large footprint now. Uh, we're not able to, uh, in, in other words, an attraction, you know. Um, sure. Uh, the, our cultural footprint is really powerful. Our economic footprint is not, um, it's very shallow, mm -hmm. but um, there's so much room for growth for us, you know. And um, Gucci and Marco Bazzari and, you know, Susan uh, Chicochi, uh, CEO and those who are running Gucci, they set a precedent that we must 
push for. We must go to all the brands, you know, because if, if our culture is going to be felt around the world, then our presence should also be felt around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Gucci spearheaded that, and I'm happy. And they showed it by, by letting me do what I was doing in Harlem. Well, it, it is terrific. Now, so we have the story of uh, this young boy trying to fill up the holes in his shoes, now to having his own table at the Met Gala yes. and, co and in collaboration with Gucci. What would you say to that young kid that was the young Dan wanting to dress up and be a showboat in Harlem as everybody else did, and now you're sort of setting the okay. stage that, for that. What I would say to him, well, Carol, my father was born in 1898, 33 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And my father only went to the third grade. And he taught himself to read. And there's a bigger story behind that I'll tell the next time. Later. But he taught himself to read, right? And then my experience in the street and changing my life, reinventing myself at a young age, um, that was probably the most important time in my life. But what made that so important is when I started to read, I read Malcolm, a speech to the grassroots. And in that speech, he said, if you want to understand the flower, study the seed. So I would say to all young people, when you decide who you want to be, just go read a book. Find your space, because that's what I did. I built this whole brand of Dapper Dam by doing all the research and all the reading. I had no connection whatsoever to the fashion industry. I did it. I came up with what I call the African American staircase, you know, with no assistance, with no outside input from the fashion industry. So it's possible. It's very possible for you. It's possible. And the if same you want way to. my father did it, young yeah. men just and young women, just do your research. Reading is what can do it. Well, you are quite, uh, quite uh, the success story and quite a wonderful human being, despite it all, you no. know. So <laughs> I want to thank you no. so much for being here today, uh, you know, from Harlem streets to traveling uh, around the world. My thanks to Harlem's very own fashion icon, Dapper Dan, for being this my guest moment, today. This moment, Carol, this moment is so, uh, so, um, this, I'm in a state, I'm in a dream state right now, man, because you've been my hero, man. I'm, I wanted to be a journalist, <laughs> to be sitting here with you. And I'd like to, we could exchange some, Oh, you know, yes, absolutely. All right, we'll, we'll uh, you know, I'll give you my clothes, you know, you get Oh, yes, us. absolutely. My, my reporter jackets. Yes, thank you so absolutely. much, Dapper Dad. Mm -hmm. That's it for us at this time. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and we will see you the next time. I'll be wearing red. <laughs> yes. Dapper Dan's red. <laughs> and I'm going to make sure that. <laughs> thank you so much. No, thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for having me.